Welcome to Big Hearted Stories. Get comfortable, our show is about to begin. The Silver Club Memory Programs, one of our Big Hearts for Senior programs, provides socialization and engaging activities for individuals who have mild to moderate memory loss, while they also provide respite for their families. How important is that? If you're a caregiver of a person with moderate dementia, that can be a half-time to a full-time job, literally 20 to 30 hours a week, just taking care of that person. Silver Club Memory Programs helps with that. I'm not sure there's anything that could be more important. And so they're now providing daily free virtual programming, a virtual support group for caregivers and telephone support and referral services for to, to send people to the right resources. Now, let me introduce storyteller number five. We have six storytellers. We're on storyteller number five. This is one of my favorites, Betty Brown Chappelle. Betty is a retired professor and she's a 2012 Martin Luther King humanitarian. She has an amazing background and boy, her talk just blew me away. She introduces us to a remarkable woman, her grandmother, Ada May, who despite her tiny stature and her humble, humble beginnings, as you'll learn about, left a massive legacy, said Betty Brown Chappelle, the matriarch. This is my grandmother, Ada Mae Woodson. As you can tell from that picture, she's a fun-loving person. She dressed up in these men's clothes at a carnival. She had a postcard taken and she sent it out to family. Something that some of us may have done ourselves is play dress up for a little fun. She lived to 97 years of age. Despite the fact that she smoked pal mouth unfiltered most of her life. Now we called her Big Mama. She came about there to me when she had on her orthopedic shoes. At her fighting weight, she's maybe 130 pounds. Life for Big Mama, unfortunately, was not always a crystal stair. Her um, birthday, July 4th, 1888, two, two and a little bit uh, decades past emancipation. But we celebrated the 4th for her and we celebrated it for the nation. But at seven years age, she and two of her sisters were unfortunately found by a police officer in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was born across the river in Owenton, Kentucky, but they didn't have a facility for children there. And he took these three daughters, these three sisters to the Cincinnati House of Refuge, which you all might know as a poorhouse. She stayed there until she was 14 years of age. At 14, she went to work for the Stafford family. And how that happened is the Stafford family chose her from a group of children. They took the children from the House of Refuge across the river to the courthouse. The children are lined up, infants to teens. And then the families walk by to see if they want to take one home. Ada May, we want you. What they wanted her for, they wanted her to take care of their three children. So she's almost a child, really, at 14, I was a child. She's a child. She's now responsible for three other children. She's sleeping in a closet every night. And someone in that household tried to molest her. And I suspect out of desperation, she met a man casually around Owen County somehow. And 
His name was James Garfield Brown. They got married instantly. I know why he married her. At that point in her life, she was stunning. And then at 15, she had the first of eight children. Seven survived. Now, unfortunately, Papa Brown was not a particularly good husband. He sometimes, I think, used the money in ways that shouldn't have been used with all those kids. And worst of all, he abused her physically. And the last straw for her was when he broke her collarbone. He moved away very quickly and his sons by then are, are older and they protected their mother. While he's away, she's making her way in the world but then he dies. And at that point, her life gets a few crystal stairs. The sons rehab what I now know of as an auto repair shop for their mother to have a home. Now, I don't know as a child that this is formally an auto repair shop. I just know that when we go to visit her, my dad says, all right, you kids, sit still. Don't touch anything. Don't break anything. And be quiet. Don't you fight. I don't want to hear any mess out of you. And we did exactly what he said. But we figured, boy, she's rich. She has to be rich. Because all of the things we have to do just to visit this precious home. No. It, and now I realize it was a rehabbed auto repair shop because you had to almost take your life in your hands, just put your foot on the floor at night to go to the bathroom because it was so cold, especially in the winter. You almost stick to the floor. But as time went on and she met a gentleman, his name was Thomas Metcalf. She met a gentleman and they fell in love. They were on the train. He was a cook and she was a passenger. And there's a glorious picture of the two of them together. She's standing in a white dress, floor length, off the shoulder. And he's got his arm around her. And they are at a bachelor and Benedict party. So she has a partner and they made that little house larger so they could have larger gatherings because the family is growing and growing and growing. She also has card parties. I know this because I have a picture of people laughing and playing cards. She's gardening and she has a little dog. And so life is pretty good for her. But I thought to myself when I recall her, I said, how in the world did she manage to nurture all of those people when she's almost a child herself? Well, there are a number of things that she did. We talked about her being fun loving. So she had fun with me. I played pickup sticks with her. And then another cousin, Gwen, she said, you know, Big Mama got down on the floor with me in her late 70s, maybe 80s and played jacks. And not only did she get down on the floor with me, she enjoyed it. She's laughing and she loved to crochet. And she even tried to teach me, but I am all thumbs, couldn't do it. Uh, we have in our family some of the artifacts of her crochet work. She uh, loved television, and she loved tea, and she loved cigarettes. So, She's watching television, and I'm sitting beside her. She puts that cigarette down. She puts the teacup down because she is watching, wrestling, gorgeous George. <laughs> Platinum shoulder length hair in the late 50s, okay? And he's getting ready to wrestle, and the bell rings, and she's like, get him, hit him, kick him. 
And so I learned from that, and I think her family did have a good time. And we also learned how to be frugal. So she's frugal because my mom said, A to make and make a dollar holler. She's frugal, but generous. So she, there wasn't a child that she didn't turn down when they asked for money. But how is she getting that money? We're learning hard work from her because I remember seeing her walk miles to the job and from the job. She's a laundress. It's not so easy when you've got to wring the clothes out with a wringer and when you have to use a scrub board and get all those spots out, right? So those dollars came hard. And I remembered that when she sent me $50 in cash in an envelope and it's addressed to Dear Better because she cannot spell Betty. Now, when I think of her, I think how amazing there are about 300 people that are her descendants and we are military officers, we are laborers, we are secretaries, we are bus drivers, we are a university professor, university administrators, we have an elected official, we have a lawyer, and we have an individual who was the director of HR for the Western Hemisphere of a Fortune 500 company. And that lawyer became an aid, a legal aid to Hillary Clinton. And I'm thinking we wouldn't be able to walk these paths without Ada May. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Betty. And a toast to Ada May. I so wish I could have met her. And now it is my true pleasure to introduce Brita Miller. She is one of the artistic directors of Big Hearts. She was on the selection panel to choose tonight's amazing storytellers. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did and coached them along with the other artistic director, Brian Cox. She coached the storytellers to become as effective as they could be given the circumstances that we were in. Brita is a speaker and an author of an award-winning book, The Caregiver Coffee Break. Boy, is that important. She also created a video of her Ticket to Heaven story, which went viral in early 2020, and it has reached now over a million views. So she's the real deal. This is really big. Her story tonight is when an apple pie is just more than a pie. So our sixth and final storyteller of the night, here is Brita Miller, the apple pie. I was my mother's caregiver, but sometimes I really got it wrong. My mom lived with us and she took her last breath in her own bed in her favorite sheets. My mom didn't have Alzheimer's disease, but she had congestive heart failure, which led to vascular dementia. So her dementia would come and go. And when she was in the fog, it was so hard. My mom wasn't always like this though. She was this sparkly little Irish lady with big green eyes who had a penchant for sprinkling Estee Lauder's youth dew as if it were holy water. She and my dad emigrated from Ireland with and raised her family, four sons and me, the only daughter. Now, my mom wasn't a great cook or anything fancy, but she could bake. She, uh, she could bake scones and soda bread with her eyes closed and her brown bread was legend, but it was her pie, her apple pie that was her claim to fame. She, she had these magic fingers 
that she could take, I don't know, a scoop of flour and a stick of butter and just make this beautiful, delicate, flaky pastry that was always a mystery to me. When she would bake, an amazing thing happened. The neighbors would just kind of show up at the side door just at precisely the right moment, especially Mr. Gillespie, for a slice of pie. And when she became a U.S. citizen, her big decision was to add cinnamon to the recipe to make it an all-American apple pie. This was a big deal. My mom was also very particular about her tea, and she schooled me in the proper way to make a pot of tea. You had to have a full rolling boil and pour the boiling water into the squatty teapot, swoosh it around, and then dump it out before you make the actual pot of tea. A tea cozy was necessary to keep it warm, and she always said that tea just tasted better in a nice china cup. So it was, it was so hard to watch her decline as she became more ill. She was such a, a feisty little lady. She was, she was that lady that you would see that would be out walking three miles a day with her little white Reeboks on. And now, now at this point, she could, her balance, she lost her balance and she could barely take a step without gripping onto her walker for dear life, which meant she couldn't do many of the essential things by herself that she loved to do. The day that she said to me that she realized that she could no longer make herself a cup of tea, she said, I'm useless, Eustace. And it was, it was so sad. So we called hospice to help us, and they were fabulous. When we learned that mom, mom's time with us was, was near the end, we, called, we decided we would have a gathering of my brothers who lived in other states who would come to our house and that we would have a party to celebrate mom. And, uh, you know, in theory, it's a good idea. Yeah, except the truth is, I would now not only have to take care of mom, but I would also have to take care of them, feed and entertain them. And in this rickety old farmhouse that we had, which, you know, three teenagers in various stages of immaturity, two dogs, a husband who worked midnights, I have a pesky day job with an office in my home so that I could care for mom 24 seven, who's 85 with dementia, and we're gonna have a big party. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, my brothers were really excited to come up and for everybody to be together. And my brother Donna called mom to say how he was looking forward to seeing her and that he couldn't wait for a piece of her delicious apple pie. And that was when things went south. From that moment on, she never stopped. Are we making the apple pie? The boys love my pie, you know. We, we can we make apple pie today? Every day, all day long, for weeks. That's all I heard. Apple pie? Is today the day we're making apple pie? Now, I have to tell you, I did not inherit my mother's magic fingers, the gift for pastry. I've tried, I, and it has not ended well. No, usually it, it's like a gray mass of something sticky and very salty, you know, from the tears. And um, I, I would get in such a, such, a, such a tizzy about this that my kids know what a conniption looks like. Not good, not good. So I called my brother. What were you thinking? Don't you know what you have unleashed? You know, you're talking about the pie. That's all she's talking about. I got to make the pie. I got to make the pie. The boys love my pie. You know she can't make a pie anymore. That means I have to make the pie. And I don't do pie. And he said, Brita, don't worry, I'll call her, I'll bring a pie, it'll be fine. So, you know, that calmed her down for a bit. And the day of the party rolls around and she starts in with, is it time for the pie? And at that precise moment, my brother walks in with a pie in a cardboard box with a clear plastic cellophane window at the top and the word Kroger printed on the side, and to add insult to injury, a big orange sticker that said, half off. My mother 
was appalled. She wouldn't even take a single bite of this store Bosch pie. And my brother, thinking he's going to make it better, says, Oh, but mom, it's good. It tastes just like your pie. <laughs> yeah. She might have dementia, but she knows apple pie. <sighs> anyway, we were able to divert her and avoid pie gate, and uh, it all ended well. So they all left, and I was wiped out. The next day, I'm packing away her good china, and I hear it again. Are we making the apple pie? Are we uh, apple pie? The boys love my apple pie. And I want to scream and say, Mom, we already had the party. We don't have to make the apple pie. It's OK. But she was obsessed. And every day, she was asking about this apple pie all the time. I'm loading the washer, and I hear the rumble of the walker down the hallway. And I know what's coming next. And I hear, apple pie? Did you get the good apples, the Granny Smiths? Apple, this would be apple pie is great. I think I'm going to lose my mind. I am the poster child of a stressed out, burned out, exhausted caregiver. I can't take it anymore. If I hear the word apple pie one more time, I'm going over the edge. And at this point, I realized that for the first time in my life, I need professional help. If this goes on, I could go before her. So I find it the name of a counselor, I call, I make an appointment. And he says, so tell me why you've come. <laughs> and I just let it go. I tell him how exhausted I am, how stressed out I am, how I'm not sleeping at night, how I have so much to do, and how hard it is to take care of everybody. And my mother is obsessed with making an apple pie. And there's no need to make the apple pie because my brothers have already been here. And I'm not good with pie. I don't like, I don't even like pie. And I don't know, I'm going to lose my mind. And he's such a good listener. And I knew he was going to be supportive. And he was going to say, you know, you're right. Boundaries are good things. We have to set limits. You know, you, you're right. But he puts down his pan his pen and his pad of paper. He leans forward and he says, Frida, you got to make the damn pie. What? I know, I know, you're busy. You got a lot to do. But just pick a date on the calendar, write it down, tell your mother you're going to make the pie, get the ingredients, and then just do it. You won't regret it. So I get all the ingredients, I lay them out on the counter, I put an apron on me and one on mom. And then I hand her the paring knife that she's always loved. And she starts to peel the apple. Now my mother did not believe in apple peelers. And even though she really struggled to do it, I remembered, she, well, the look in her eyes, she was just in her glory. She used to be able to peel an apple in one unbroken curly ribbon of peel. And it reminded me of how when I was a little girl, she would curl my long brown hair with those magic fingers into ringlets or banana curls with big bobby pins and set them that way. So she couldn't really peel the apple. So I finished peeling all the apples and then slicing them according to her directions Mary Kelly would not be rushed. We put them in the big mixing bowl with the right spices. I gave her the wooden spoon so she could give it a couple of good stirs, which she did. And then we had the dough, the dreaded pastry. And she gave me really specific instructions, and I did my best. I had the big old rolling pin, and I'm rolling it back and forth and sideways and whacking it, and she's giving it a whack, and there's flour everywhere. I mean, it was on the counter, on the floor, on, on, on the dough, and all over me, I looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I got it to an acceptable thickness and wrestled it into the pie plate, and then we had to arrange the slices just so. And as we were doing that, our hands touched. And I remembered how she used to tell me when I was practicing my Irish step dancing to point my toe just so and hold my arms loosely at my sides as she had been taught in Ireland. 
We put the lid on the pie crust and I used that little knife and trimmed the edges all around. And she asked for a scrap of dough and the knife again. And then she cut out three little leaves in the pastry and told me to place them right in the center of the pie crust. So I did. We put it in the oven and when it was done, presented the pie on the table in front of her. And the look on her face was something. She was able to eat a few bites of pie along with a nice cup of tea in her china cup. And she said to me, this is the best pie I've ever made. And you know, I felt so ashamed. How could I have been so clueless to be so focused on all the, the caregiver things, all the things that I thought were so important of organizing and keeping the train running and doing all the stuff that I missed the most important thing of all. And I was so grateful to be called out before it was too late. Because you know, it was never about the pie. It was about making the pie. And on that afternoon, I got such a wonderful gift. I stopped being her caregiver, and I was able to be Mary Kelly's daughter. Thank you. Wow, that was so amazing, <laughs> Brita. Thank you so much for that. I, it put tears in my eyes. Um, and I wanna thank you, Brita, and I wanna thank all of the other team for putting together this amazing group of storytellers. You know, it, it, putting together some type of event like this, a giving event, was not simple when it moved online and no one knew exactly, you know, we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, also things were changing all the time. So it's kind of like putting airplane wings on an airplane while it's still flying. It wasn't simple at all. Um, but but Brita and the rest of the team, the leaders of these uh, Big Hearts for Seniors programs really uh, wanted to tackle this. And I'm so impressed with them and what they've done. They're real heroes to me. Um, you know, we're all going through a, a very tough time right now. We all feel a lot of stress from this pandemic every day. Some people feel a lot more stress than others. The people who we're trying to give our donations to uh, feel stress that's so much more difficult. Can you imagine what some of them are going through right now? Seniors who are essentially locked up and quarantined, who are scared that if they get this virus, that they'll die from it. Um, that's a very different experience than many of us. People who can't see others, you know, we can't see our, our senior adult friends and loved ones. It's really, really difficult for everybody. But the question right now, as we're closing up right now, is can we become purposeful in this pandemic? Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, right? You remember him? Jonas Salk, by the way, was a researcher, guess where? At the University of Michigan. He was a researcher right in our School of Public Health. And here's what he said a little later in our lives, in his life. He said, our responsibility is to be good ancestors. Our responsibility is to be good ancestors. Betty Brown Chappelle's grandmother, Ada May, was a good ancestor. Brita's mother was a good ancestor. Can we look back and say that we were good ancestors? We'll look back and say these people that we're supporting are good ancestors, but let's take ourselves out 10 years from now, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. Let's go to our grandchildren and their children and their children, maybe even 200 years from now. Will they be able to look back at us and say, they were good ancestors. The people in this community right now in this meeting, are you gonna be a good ancestor? Because a big part of being a good ancestor is being purposeful and focusing your attention and your goals on the things that matter most.